everybody, and uh, welcome to today's webinar, Recovery for Small Manufacturing, presented to you by North Metro SBDC. My name is John Hoey. I'm the Special Projects Consultant here at North Metro, and I'm excited to get right into our topic today, Organizational Structure Recovery for Small Manufacturing Businesses. For those of you who are looking to adjust and optimize as Colorado reopens for business after COVID-19 or during COVID-19 as it, as it turns out to be. Our presenters today are John Jaggers, lead consultant with SBDC for some time now, and Mary Stevenson, PhD, who is the CEO of Dell Tech Furnaces and who's been a leader in business for over 30 years. I'll let them go ahead and uh, say a little bit more about themselves here in just a moment. But before I turn the presentation over to John and Mary, I wanna point out a few features in the webinar panel. So there's a downloadable handout for this presentation. It includes a checklist for small manufacturing recovery that you can click and download. It's on the right side of your screen. And it's gonna be important that you download this during the presentation. This link will disappear once the webinar is closed. So find that handout, click that PDF, and uh, save it to your hard drive there. Also, if you miss anything during the show, don't worry, we are recording this webinar. We'll post a video to the North Metro SBDC YouTube channel a little bit later today, and you'll get a follow-up email with uh, the link to that video. Finally, we have the ability for you to answer, or sorry, to ask questions at any point during the webinar. You can type them in the question panel that's also on that GoToWebinar uh, application, and we'll see your questions, and uh, John and Mary will do their best to answer those either during the show or we'll do a Q&A at the end, and they'll try to answer those questions for you. So I uh, hope that's a good intro for you, and I'm going to turn it over to you, John. Tell us what we're going to learn today. Okay, great. Well, first of all, John, thank you for uh, this opportunity to, uh, to talk about the very trying times that we're in right now. Uh, just real quick, my experience has been 25 plus years in manufacturing, I'm very fortunate to work for some uh, some large companies that uh, really had sound principles of organizational optimization, whatever that means. I think it's a good thing. But anyway, uh, so six years ago, I went into semi-retirement and got bored in about five minutes and was lucky enough to uh, to be able to be part of the SBDC North Metro team. And uh, I think it's a very fortunate thing from a standpoint of, I get to work with a lot of, a great number of clients that, uh, including Mary, which we're gonna talk to here in a second, uh, and watch them grow and prosper, uh, both financially and from a standpoint of their employees. So Mary, just if you can give me just a real, Give us a real quick bio. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Um, I've been working in our family-owned business for about 35 years now. The last 20 of it as, um, as, as much in charge as you can be of a small business. Um, and like most small business owners, doing whatever needed to be done on any given day. So you might be shipping packages in the morning and making sales in the afternoon. I know you all know the drill. Okay, and John, if we can start the uh, actual presentation, that'd be terrific. There we go. Okay, so uh, go ahead, John. So really what we're, we're talking about, this, this model that I've put together, and, and actually Mary is the perfect example, and, and I'm gonna allow her to, to talk about some details of, of each of the pieces that, that I talk about. But I hopefully, hopefully this is a, what I would call a, a clear path to retooling. And the things that we're gonna talk about are our resources, including our people, systems, and a different culture that because of COVID, uh, we, you may have a wonderful culture, but the culture is changing just because the world is changing. So go ahead, John. So again, I'm gonna wanna read this, but basically the future 
future state is much different than has been in the past. Uh, in order to survive, you need to have solid business structure, which we're gonna talk about, and combining that with innovation from a standpoint of, as to how you lead your employees, because again, it is a different world. And I think those companies that demonstrate that clear vision and resilience, I think resilience is an important thing because we're all going through the same challenging uh, times. So we, we as business owners have to have adaptability to change uh, because it is different and uh, jolly to take on some new approaches. So what we're gonna talk about, the key components of recovery are uh, talent management, financial tracking, marketing techniques, technical capabilities, the new culture that I was talking about. And then we're gonna have a operational checklist, which is just a follow-up uh, checklist that goes into a little more detail that you can use at your discretion. Okay, and then one more slide, Jim. So let's start off with talent management because we have a lot of us uh, have shut down or a lot of you have shut down possibly unless you were deemed essential. And so now you gotta regroup. And so, you know, what's the best approach from a, a recruiting standpoint? I found and I deal with 20, 25 clients every, almost every month. So I, I get the opportunity to find out how they're hiring. Uh, and it's a challenge, and Mary's going to talk about that here in a second. But some of the some of the better recruiting sites are Indeed and, and Zip, the Classdoor, and Craigslist. Uh, and there should be many excellent candidates to fill because because of the high rate of unemployment, uh, which would be an opportunity to strengthen your workforce. However, keep in mind of a couple of things, and Mary's going to talk about this. Employees are going to be more selective. They're not just going to go out and get any job. They're going to be very selective. So there's, you have to provide that culture that we're going to talk about uh, that is attractive to them. Uh, and then go ahead, John. The other piece, one, once you have employees hired as a new hire, and hopefully they bring some skills that are that are adaptable to your organization, but what what Mary and I did six years ago, we put together a, what's called a skills matrix. And all that is, is a simple outline of the skills required uh, to progress uh, to competency on that particular job. Very, very simple tool, uh, but a very effective tool uh, because it's not only creates expectations for the employee, and it's also can be an evaluation tool. And Mary's gonna talk all about that. And then based on the needs of your organization, whether it's new or current employees, uh, where there are skill gaps, uh, a training plan should be put together. So Mary, let's talk about Deltec a little bit, uh, your experience with, with this. Okay, well, for recruiting, um, Indeed and Craigslist and referrals from friends and family have been successful tools for us in the past. We all know that before COVID hit with the booming economy, it's harder to get people on board, particularly for us production workers. And I think that's a common story in manufacturing. Um, we actually managed to hire some people post COVID, but none of them worked out. And uh, we know that part of the problem is the high unemployment that's being paid right now. We're sort of hoping that there'll be more candidates out there as that, as that changes. In terms of the training matrix, that has been such a great tool. Our production supervisor uses that from the recruiting stage on. So um, in other words, when he's interviewing someone, he will not only go over the job description with them, but also the training matrix. So they know more details about the exact kind of work that they're going to be expected to do and when they're going to be expected to have mastered certain tasks. And with that, of course, comes the expectation that they're going to be trained appropriately and on time. So it's a commitment on our part to train them to help them be successful. 
And then that, that training matrix goes on and is used um, during the evaluation process as well. Um, here's what you've mastered, here's where you're lacking, um, here's sort of the time frame in which you have to, to make up any deficiencies, and here's how we're going to help you with that. Yeah, because there are, in your case, there are uh, four or five different skill levels which actually correspond with the rate of pay, which is outstanding. It creates that uh, expectation and opportunity uh, for the employee to see, okay, if, if I get this training and I can demonstrate those skills, then potentially I can move up to the next level. So, yeah. Yes, absolutely. So, and they know where there is to go to, if you will, because, you know, we're a very small company. We're usually under 10 people. And so there isn't a lot of room for advancement, but you can certainly advance yourself in that regard and just become a greater asset to the company. Absolutely. Okay, John, let's move on to the next, the next slide. So a big part of our world, what's going on is, is financial tracking. And if, if we haven't done a good job in the past, now it's key because we're going through a ramping up period, a retooling period, and it's gonna, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of thought to see what direction you're gonna go. So the budget forecast on a, I think at least on a quarterly basis, I think is, is essential uh, to show where your sales are going to be and what your costs are going to be, uh, and it, you know, it's a, it's a, it provides a, a clear path and plan for staffing, purchasing, and and sales. And the next, the next piece is financials. Um, now, a lot of times, I've run into into clients that will do financials on on a quarterly basis. Uh, which which is okay, uh, you know. I would recommend if you if you can ease your way into it, I would be doing it on a on a on a monthly basis. But the other part of that is many many of manufacturing clients have gotten the paycheck protection uh, program loans or the idle loans, and it's really key that you uh, segment those costs either into a separate line item or a, different, or a separate bank account, whatever it is, because you're going to come back around and, and SBA and your bank are going to say, okay, prove it. If you want forgiveness, you're going to have to have to prove it. So the, that part of it is key. And Mary's going to talk about this in a second. And then the next, next item is inventory control. Uh, we, you as manufacturers, uh, have to maintain inventory, and I think uh, tight controls on that are, are really key, particularly as you're ramping up your sales. Um, again, you go back to your forecast, okay, what am I going to need in the way of materials and labor, uh, materials for inventory, obviously, um, in order to meet those sales forecasts. Um, and then the last thing we're going to talk about is cash flow. That's such a critical piece right now because uh, you have gone through such a trying period. Uh, if you were shut down, obviously, it's very, very tough. And hopefully, you were, you're able to get uh, one of the one of the types of uh, stimulus loans. But uh, so keeping track of cash flow is is really, really important. So, Mary, how have you used these tools uh, with Delta? Well, budgeting and forecasting was new for us. We have um, we use QuickBooks Enterprise, and it's a very powerful tool. Um, but I hadn't even thought about budgeting and forecasting until I was asked by an SBA lender to look into my crystal ball for the next year and a half. And that's when I started to pay attention to that piece of it. In the past, we've paid attention to um, kind of planning a bit for advertising costs and for salaries, but then just being reactive when it came to changes in cost of goods sold and other expenses. So we've, we've just started down this path. We did do some budgeting and forecasting and just have to see how that comes out for us. Um, 
I uh, totally agree about the importance of having good financial statements. They're a great reference for you in seeing how your business is doing on uh, at least a quarterly basis. We probably should be reviewing those monthly. Um, inventory control, again, um, enterprise is, is, uh, has powerful inventory control functions, but what we don't have in place yet, and John knows we've been struggling with this for probably the whole five years he's worked with us, is a real-time uh, system that gives us real-time information on what's in inventory. So we kind of take things out of inventory using a uh, some manual methods that aren't very uh, efficient and are very time consuming. On the other hand, we've got a good handle on our purchasing and receiving, um, partly because it's part of our quality control program. We're ISO 9001 2015 certified. And um, so the, the bottom line is, is that nothing comes in the door and gets entered in inventory that doesn't have a very clear paper or these days rather digital trail involved. Um, cash flow is, it's just a nightmare. It just continues to be a nightmare. It's only getting worse. Um, we have customers who are powerful enough to be able to dictate terms, and sometimes those are 120 days out. We have been, over the past few years, getting progress payments on large projects, and that's been a, a tremendous help. But honestly, a new problem we've had with two customers in the past few months on large projects is when the project is about completed, they want to change the payment terms. As a matter of fact, I had that happen to me this morning. So uh, I, I, I think maybe it's part of the new normal. I'm, I'm worried about it. Okay, well, Mary, as, as always, uh, you are very humble about uh, what you've accomplished, and uh, I'll take very little credit, but your, your control of inventory is 100% better than what it was uh, a couple years ago, mostly because, you're, <laughs> mostly because you're, you're very organized, everything, all parts are, are uh, identified, and what you're talking about from the standpoint of purchasing, uh everything everything that comes in with a packing slip is matched uh to a po on a tablet and immediately recognize any any uh any errors or any uh any back ordered items which really helps from a standpoint of your uh moving forward and being ready for the the next furnace that you're going to build so absolutely okay okay john let's move on one second. So the the next thing we're going to talk about is technical capabilities, and one of the one of the things that uh, I, from my past experience and you know, working with clients today, is the application of lean. And uh, for those of you that haven't applied that, I would certainly recommend it. And really, all lean is is how can I reduce waste, whether it's time, motion, or or energy. Uh, there are some very simple tools that will help you get organized. Uh, I would, uh, you know, if you're interested in that, I'd recommend myself. But uh, so you got to go through SVDC, and uh, we can certainly work with you on that. And Mary's going to going to give a little testimonial on it here in a second. Uh, the other one, other piece that I think is extremely important is taking advantage of today's technology. So whatever type of software you choose, both financial and operational tracking, I think are, are very, very important. Uh, Mary uses QuickBooks to, to the nth degree. Uh, some of my clients that are a little more on the retail side use point of sale software. And some of the larger uh, clients that I deal with uh, have the enterprise resource planning, which is a, kind of an all encompassing software that includes everything from the quote all the way to out the door. Pretty complex. I'm not gonna sit here and say I would recommend that. Mary and I have talked about it a couple of times, but uh, it does require a lot of manpower to maintain, although it does provide uh, some good information. So one more, John. Uh, the last piece, which, which is technical, uh, first of all, if you do have 
that well-trained workforce and some structure to your operating system, you're going to end up with excellent quality. And uh, Mary and her team have been ISO certified for the last three years. And I'll let Mary talk about all that. Okay, well, the lean techniques, John came into our production area, kind of watched the workflow and um, asked some questions and then came back with recommendations um, using the various tools of lean. Our production supervisor is well organized and uh, has great attention to detail. And so he has um, used every tool I think that John has taught him to improve our production floor uh, cleanliness organization workflow. Um, even in a small company, those are, are very important um, things. Um, software, again, the QuickBooks Enterprise for all financial and also um, payroll. And um, we also use the standard, you know, uh, office suite of uh, tools, Outlook, Office, Excel. And sometimes um, for certain people, certain situations, we make use of project manager. Um, and uh, also our engineering department uses um, Inventor. So lots of software. I can't imagine functioning without the kind of software that we have available. Um, in addition to good training, we also have some structure um, to help us with product and service consistency. We have checklists, quality checklists, that follow the product through from the time the order is placed through till the time it's shipped. And everyone signs off on those sheets, so we have accountability. But again, with that expectation comes that you have been trained to to understand what's on the checklist and to, to follow through. So uh, just to give you an example of how good this can be, we used to have at least a customer every month who would call up and say, I'm, I'm missing components or this is wrong. And now it's, it's rare. I think we've had one in the last six months. So that of course saves us money and we all wanna keep our customers happy. And that certainly goes a long way when their order is right when they get it. Mary, uh, talk about just for one second your ISO certification and how you know how you how that's helped your quality level. Yes, well, since that's the um, entire focus of the ISO program, um, it becomes a part of your culture because if it doesn't. It doesn't work effectively. So um, I know years ago when ISO first came out, I had the opinion that you were just making up some policies and procedures and not following them, or you didn't have to worry about following them. You were doing the, you know, the proverbial pencil whipping of a quality program. But that's not the case at all. Um, you, you totally buy in and you want to buy in because it so improves your um, your product, your service capabilities, your workflow. It's well worth the investment in time and effort and initial expense for getting um, some help from a consultant to, to get that program up and running. So I, I really, I, I'm really um, a strong supporter of, of ISO 9001 or whatever kind of ISO is appropriate for your organization. All right, and that's been and we're going to talk about this in a second, but that's been the foundation for even advanced sort of certifications where you're going to get involved in the, the nuclear market uh, and QA1, which uh, that's pretty, pretty uh, unique to Mary, uh, but it does prove that ISO uh, will work and will uh, create the consistency that's needed. So. Well, John, can I add one more thing to that too? The other thing about the ISO is that it gives you credibility internationally. Everybody recognizes the ISO standard. So that helps you with your sales. That's a very good point. And, uh, and Mary does sell internationally. Uh, she was the 2019 uh, World Trade Center Exporter of the Year last year. So Mary, we got to 
I'd say hurrah for that. <laughs> okay, we're, we're, gonna, we're, giving our, we're giving ourselves too much praise. <laughs> okay, so marketing. I, I know you you think this is a uh, manufacturing uh, webinar, but let me tell you, in the last six years, I've learned more about marketing than I ever thought I would. And even now, marketing is changed even further and uh, you probably every one of you is experiencing this we're now in into an e-commerce world where uh you are going to have to sell your products uh, across the web uh and it's gonna that's not gonna change for the next 12 to 18 months depending on how covid goes uh so some of the things some things you can do uh first and foremost your website needs to be um so good that it does demonstrate your products and services um, based on the new normal uh, we've been talking about your uh, you need to have a, a clear understanding of really what what your your customers are what are what they want so so customer needs and expectations will drive your sales if you have a good understanding of, of your market and then the, the final piece too to the website, uh, customer reviews. Every client that I that I uh, consult with, I tell them constantly, our world operates off of customer reviews, referrals, feedback. Everybody looks. Man, they'll go to your website and they will expect to see uh, some powerful testimonials to your products and your service. So those are those are very key things. So Mary, what what have you learned over the last couple of years? Well, um, we have a, a new a new website rolling out, and um, unlike a lot of companies who I understand e-commerce is going to be the way to go, so far it doesn't seem to be a good fit for us. And unfortunately, our website is based on Woo. Mm -hmm. Uh, WooCommerce, which is kind of an e-commerce platform. So we're going to be changing over um, from that. Um, we do a lot of custom work. And so one of the things that we try and emphasize is that even though we have standard products, um, we want everybody to be aware um, on every page that they look at that they can always turn to us for any sort of custom, custom design work. Um, we feel like we have a pretty good take on who our customers and our potential customers are. And of course, it's important to design and, and um, establish, uh, keep up a website, adding new information that responds to what those particular people are interested in. So our customers are engineers and scientists, and they want information and the more of it the the better so maybe white papers that help them um, choose which kind of furnace is best for them for example um, and john has convinced me um, and our website designer agrees of the power of customer reviews so we're planning for the new site each and every page will have a um, attributed or not attributed um, uh, customer review because we have a certainly a big bank of comments from from customers from over the years. So, oh, and I I mentioned to you, John said about e-commerce. One of our vendors um, who sells industrial products to furnace manufacturers like us. I just saw in my email a few minutes before the webinar today that they have rolled out a new website and they're going to be selling their products on an e-commerce platform. Totally new thing. All right. Well, that's the direction we're going. You know, understanding because this is again, this has changed over the last couple of years, but you gotta gotta be adaptive and pivot based on where you, what your customers want. But the demographics of your customers have changed where uh, it's not off the shelf furnaces anymore. It's, it's the custom furnaces that are pretty complex. They're very complex. And uh, because of the systems that you put together, you and your team have put together, you've been able to adapt to that. Uh, so 
I think that's a it's a very important point. We we got to we have to adjust and change with the time, which is what we're we're talking about. So, boy, for sure, and you have to pay attention to that all the time. I think, John. I mean, just always be aware, always be listening to what customers and potential customers are saying to you and what they're asking for, where things seem to be trending. Right. Okay, John, we can move on. So let's talk about, I think this is a very interesting point uh, and Mary has experienced this and we're gonna let her talk about it in more detail, but to be able to, be able to attract and retain those new employees, uh, you have to communicate very well on a consistent basis. On a weekly basis, you need to be talking to your employees as you know much as possible. Even if you have a small group, it's still important that they understand uh, that management will communicate in a clear and reassuring manner, and that's part of your vision, uh, which which will. Uh, boost boost their confidence that you know the direction that you want to go and also create some collaboration like that says next point uh, so the other thing that in my 30 years of manufacturing experience one of the things that we seem to miss out on is that our employees provide once you know once they've been on the job for a while and particularly the millennials, they've got a mind that works, they have minds that work well and they wanna contribute. That's a big part of their makeup. Uh, so we need, I think it's very, very important that, that we create colder cultures that uh, build on that creativity and innovation. And, but you gotta ask, you gotta have some kind of mechanism or platform where you get their input and then try their best ideas. Lean is a great way to do it, but there's other ways of just communicating uh, and trying to apply their, their best ideas. And then the other thing which I think is important, and, and again, I've and the 20 or 25 uh, clients that I deal with, I tell them this every time that, okay, in today's times where we're, it's such a trying time for and high stress time for all of us. It's very, very important that we as leaders demonstrate trust and empathy for our employees, our customers and our vendors, uh, in particular to our employees that have families that they're trying to uh, keep happy and keep healthy. And uh, so flexibility is very, very important these days. You can't Everything's not going to be from uh, nine to five. You come in, they punch your card and go home. It's more of a case where if I have a problem with my child or my spouse. Uh, you got to be, you got to be in a position where you do have that empathy and and feelings for your employees. They're going to appreciate that, and I guarantee you they will talk among themselves about it. So, so Mary, what? Talk a couple of seconds about you know how your culture has changed. Well, you know we were we had a relaxed environment before anyway because there's so few of us. Um, and JJ, my son and business partner, and I have always talked openly in front of employees about cash flow problems, customer problems, whatever. Um, so I feel like we already had sort of a we're all in this together. Um, uh, environment. And then when COVID hit, we were declared an essential business and everybody um, breathed a sigh of relief. And I really feel like it brought the group even um, closer together than it was. Um, and flexibility and compassion, 100%. Uh, I think we all have to have that for one another in this time. We don't even know if employees with, with kids in school um, are the kids going to be back in classrooms? Uh, that's all up in the air, and we're just going to have to do the best we can to adapt and to help our 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 employees so that they can help us um, stay in business as well. So it works ways. Um, employ we belong to employers council, 
which is basically kind of a human resources support group. And they have been saying the same things. Flexibility and compassion are just key right now. Um, empowerment and, and uh, team building. I will give you an example from uh, our the interface between production and engineering. Um, John, um, probably a couple years ago, encouraged us to start having weekly production meetings where engineering and production would sit down together, review jobs, review problems, review requirements for tools, um, infrastructure, whatever, whatever was needed. Um, and we've now honed that down to where it takes less than a half an hour, happens every Monday. And I love watching the interface between the two, between the two groups because um, if there's um, a, an issue that engineering maybe hasn't quite worked out, um, the mechanical part of something, um, they will brainstorm. And our production team um, will oftentimes come up with a solution and um, vice versa. And it's wonderful to see the way they, they work together to get the work done, product out the door, and you just have that sense that everybody is really proud of not only our product um, that we're churning out the door, but also the um, the camaraderie that's that's happening. And I think since the other thing since COVID hit, um, I see like we have some remote workers, and I think the fact that we're just counting on them to do their jobs, um, there's no attempt at oversight. I think um, I know someone who said they're using some kind of a software project where you have to kind of clock in when you're actually working and clock out when you're not. We're not doing any of that. And, and I think that's I think that's important to maintaining the culture that we've established and, and want to continue. Oh, that's great, Mary. Okay, so we're going to move on to a wrap up here. I think John's given us a, a, a clue to move ahead. Um, so this is just an outline of positive steps that you can take. Uh, you know, we're all we're all facing the same thing, and it, it's pretty overwhelming. But uh, taking the time to build the structure, uh, I think, is extremely important. Um, and again, this is uh, go ahead, John. These are just actions. Kind of an outline of actions that uh, that can be taken, and uh, certainly there's a whole lot more detail to to make them happen than what we've talked about. Uh, uh, Mary and her situation has been working on this diligently for the last couple of years to get to the point where she's at. Uh, and yeah, but hope, hopefully this is a bit of a roadmap um, to rebuild and. But at the same time, I, I think it's very, very important that we demonstrate that empathy and compassion for our employees. We're going to retain them. They're going to be loyal. They're going to be dedicated if we do that. So we've also, actually, as Mary suggested, we put together a checklist that you can use, which actually, uh, uh, one, more, one more page there, John. This is just a a summary of what we talked about, and it gives you the opportunity to go through and say, oh, okay, I'm good at this, uh, done this, uh, and it gives you, we're, we're all, we all have a human nature, we like to get things accomplished. So just another way for me to put together uh, a methodology to, to work through, through these different things. Uh, again, and I, I know John's gonna say this, but, uh, there's probably going to be a lot of follow-up on your part. Um, I, I happen to love the SPDC uh, North Metro. So, <laughs> so John, what do we have for question? Well, you know, I'm looking at our question panel right now, and um, I don't see any. So, audience, this is your opportunity. <laughs> to go ahead and uh, type in any questions that you have for, for John or Mary. And uh, while we're waiting for those questions, boy, this might be a good time for me to just give a few quick announcements uh, about some upcoming programming. 
You know, for those of you that might not uh, be familiar with the SBDC, you should visit our website. It's northmetrospdc.com. And our mission is to provide low cost uh, training and free training, and then also free one-on-one -on -one business consulting. So you can go right onto our site and uh, make an appointment with the first available consultant, or you can kind of scroll through and see. We have experts in a whole bunch of different fields, marketing, manufacturing, like John. Uh, we have uh, veterans, uh, specialists, and uh, many different specialities. You can choose a consultant that would meet your needs the best and make a free appointment and uh, start a relationship with a business consultant that can really help. So I do encourage you to do that. We also have some upcoming programs that I'm excited to tell you about. Uh, as soon as we wrap up this webinar here, uh, you could switch over at noon and learn about our creative entrepreneurship series that's coming up. Um, so there's a free webinar. You can sign up for that on our website. It's the creative entrepreneurship series, five week class on starting your business if you're not yet in business, especially if you're in a, a creative industry. We're also hosting a business continuity forum, which is this Thursday at 3.30 p.m. Highly recommend that you sign up for that one. Again, the link is on our website, northmetrospdc.com. We're going to have a legal expert, marketing expert, human resources expert, a panel of seven experts all together talking about moving forward through COVID and opportunity to really uh, ask your questions and fix some important brains there as well. Next week uh, at 11 a.m. on Thursday, uh, or every week at Thursday, we have Market Matters, which is a weekly look at the, the markets. And then next Tuesday at 11, we have Email Marketing 101 with another of our consultants, Megan Bortner. She runs her own consulting firm, her own uh, marketing firm, Labyrinth Digital, and she's going to give us an introductory course on how to optimize your emails to communicate with your customers. Uh, all right, those are our upcoming programming. We do have a question that just rolled in. Uh, so this is uh, for, for both of you. Lisa Colwell asks, what suggestions do you have for dealing with the changes in terms? And then she writes a little bit more. Mary said some of her customers have gone to net 120 and we have had something similar happen. How and when do you tactfully talk to a large customer about that situation? Mary, I'm going to let you answer that one. That you're tactful. Mary, did you hear me? I think we've lost Mary. Oh, your video might be a little frozen here, Mary. Technology gets you every time. <laughs> I've got, um, I, I didn't hear any of that. I've got a network connection. Okay, um, no worries. So you're back. Um, here's the question, Mary. This comes from Lisa. She's watching the program. Everything's she said, frozen. Oh, no. Can you hear me now? No, she can. Broken. <laughs> uh, a little bit, and then it breaks up again. I don't know what's wrong. All right. Well, uh, Lisa is asking about changes in terms. She has a large client who uh, she heard that you had a client uh, go to net 120, and she said that she's had something similar happen. So her question is, how and when do you tactfully talk to a large customer? about a, a big change in terms like that. I think she's still frozen, yeah. It is. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, Lisa, thank you for that question. And uh, what, what we'll do is, you know, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get that answer for you in writing, and we'll post that in the thank you email after the broadcast. Unfortunately, the, the connection's a little bit slow. So no stress on that. Okay. And uh, Lisa just texted it and she said, that will work, thanks. Thank you, Lisa, for the flexibility. Great. Well, uh, I'm gonna turn this back over to John and Mary for some final words and uh, we'll wrap up this presentation. John, anything that you wanna leave your viewers with today? 
you know, I think uh, I made a point under culture, which I want to repeat because I think it's it's worth worthwhile. I don't normally read things, but this is this is worthwhile. So, talking about flexibility and compassion, this is not an experiment that any of us opted for, and transitioning out of it is as effective requires leaders to demonstrate trust and empathy. Trust. Trust and empathy for their employees in particular. So, this is uh, unusual circumstances, challenging circumstances, but one of the themes that has gone across all the webinars is resilience, and resilience is adaptability to what's happening. So, that's that's where we're at. This is our our uh, new normal, unfortunately. So, Mary, what what else do you want to add? I guess I would say in addition to resilience or as part of resilience is um, uh, continuing a continuous improvement as John taught us uh, years ago when ISO has certainly reinforced. Don't get so caught up in just trying to survive that you kind of let everything else fall to the side. It's hard. I know we're struggling too. <laughs> It is hard, but you know, that's uh, great advice, Mary and John, and you don't have to do it alone, folks. So find a mentor. Metro SBDC is a good place to start, but there's many mentors out there and uh, get some help and we'll move forward. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much, Mary. That's all the time we have today. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the presentation and uh, look for that video link, uh, folks if you want to replay any portion of this broadcast. So thank you very much. Thank you, John. See you on the Thanks next session. Bye.